on uh, Alberta from the quantum phase transition between the Charleston and the Magnus and the Magnus. Uh, right, so, so thanks to the organizers uh, for giving me an opportunity to speak. So I'm going to uh, present some work which is based on this paper here uh, at the bottom, uh, done with the former first at our group, Chen Hong Lin, and uh, my advisor, Justin Taylor. So before I get into the uh, the actual work, let me just uh, start by uh, providing some brief experimental motivation for why we should endeavor to study such transitions. Right, so if we look at this uh, rough classification of materials here as a function of uh, electronic correlations and synovic coupling. Uh, so for large synovic coupling and moderate correlations in the class of materials called the metallic materials. Now, what's special about these materials is that one would naively expect that these would be metals uh, because these materials are, you know, the irritates and the renates, you know, they are very uh, heavy atoms with a large atomic radius. So one would, uh, so which implies a large bandwidth. And this would uh, normally suppress electronic correlations and uh, the result would be a metal. But because of the large phenobic coupling in these compounds, you have uh, essentially, you know, which suppresses the bandwidth, even for moderate co electronic correlations, you have uh, the emergence of a mass insulating phase. So we can tell materials in particular, uh, for instance, uh, as I did some example compounds here, the radiates and renates, and then most famously, alpha ruthenium chloride um, are effectively uh, spin half uh, module insulators with an effective spin half on every lattice site. It is called ketide materials. Now, uh, what's common about most of these materials is that they are they have a heavy ionic core, which is like iridium or ruthenium, surrounded by some octahedral cage. Of chlorine atoms or oxygen atoms. And uh, the result is that you know these heavy atoms lie on a honeycomb lattice, like so. So the shadow is the octahedral cage. And then this uh, such materials are uh, proposed to form a uh, realization of the type of spin liquids. So, but however, in reality, the materials are described by, by a much more complicated Hamiltonian, which have, in addition to the design interactions, they have uh, hydrophobic chain terms. And then you also have uh, other more complicated uh, terms. And then if the optical case is not perfect, it could be other terms, um, terms, and so on. So the hope is that uh, in these materials, the ketide is very prolonged and one could possibly observe a ketide spin liquid. So uh, there's been a tremendous amount of experimental activity and I've been issued studies in these materials and the uh, situation is still a complete mess. There is no consensus on pretty much anything, but uh, two scenarios have emerged. So two common scenarios. So some experiments, uh, so they do, they go and look at these uh, materials. So what they find as a phase, in a phase diagram is simply just some magnetically ordered state, typically some zigzag magnetic order. So uh, that's not what we want, you know? So this seems to indicate that the guitar physics is not really dominant. Um, so what do we do in this uh, situation? So to kill an antiferromagnet, we just simply apply an external magnetic field, right? So that's what that's what these people have done uh, in the hopes that it will be replaced with something more uh, joyous. With the and uh, in most experiments, that in, and again, some experiments observe an intermediate. So for very large external magnetic fields, obviously the state will become a uh, spin polarized state, which is even more boring than the uh, antiferromagnet that we see these but uh, other experiments claim to find a quantum spin liquid uh, sandwiched between the po uh, polarized state and then the uh, antiferromagnetic state. Uh, now, the type of spin liquid this is is again hotly debated. In fact, whether it is a spin liquid at all is also under debate. Uh, but you know, um, there are some promising results. So one very nice result is by this uh, group in Kyoto, uh, Matsuda's group who uh, claim to find a uh, one-sized half thermal uh, whole conductance for the quantum spin liquid state. But again, this has to be taken with uh, sacks of salt because it hasn't been reproduced. And the experiment was done in 2018. So now um, for someone more, in the debate in this compound and in these real Kitai materials is to be settled by uh, more ab initio studies and experimental, exper more experiments. But for someone more inclined towards uh, formal matters, this does, this graph does raise, uh, this diagram does raise an interesting question. And that is, can I have a, can I describe, how can I describe within the framework of effective field theory, uh, a transition between different states, which are 
which require very different uh, theoretical descriptions. For instance, the magnetically ordered state, the, uh, whether it be a ferromagnet or an antiferromagnet, spontaneously breaks uh, some DQ type symmetry in an easing system. Uh, and then we, of course, have the trivial paramagnet, and we know how to describe those two, that's round out. Uh, but uh, the chiral symmetry state, for instance, is described within the great framework of uh, apart from mean field theory. So uh, this back to you know, whether the fact that we observe these kinds of transitions between spin liquids, which have no local local order parameter, and um, ordered phases of matter, begs the question that uh, can we come up with a unifying framework to describe all these phases and transitions between them? So we're not the first ones to ask this question, obviously. So there have been uh, many prior studies, including by many people in this room. Um, Specifically, a uh, lot of attention has focused on the Dirac spin liquid, the gaseous spin liquid, and uh, transitions out of the Dirac spin liquid into approximate ordered phases of matter. Uh, there's also some uh, prior work with the Chiral spin liquids, numerical studies, and field theory works. Um, but uh, we decided to approach this problem from a slightly different uh, perspective. So our theoretical motivation actually comes from a from a paper by Bakhtiari and McGreevy uh, in 2014 where they use the parton uh, description of a uh, hardcore boson in terms of uh, two fermionic partons to uh, come up with uh, field theory that can describe transitions between a fractional monomole state, a uh, super fluid, and one phase of the boson. And the way they do this is, of course, by uh, writing the boson operator as a uh, product of fermionic partons, and then, and then uh, assuming a mean field theory in which each parton is assumed to form a channel insulator. For instance, psi one forms the turn insulator with turn number one, and then psi two is due to form a turn insulator with C. And then the idea is that you vary C to find axis in varying phases. Um, but of course, writing the uh, the part on decomposition itself introduces the gauge structure in the theory, where uh, and the gauge, exact precise gauge structure is SU2, but that is broken down to a U1 subgroup uh, by a specific choice of mean field runtime. Uh, and you can simply see the gate structure because if you work through a gate rotation of these fermions uh, with opposite gate charges for both, the boson operator itself will remain in there. So let me just give a brief uh, idea of how to access these phases. So for instance, the fractional quantum mole state. So if uh, both partons are assumed to set form turn insulators with the same turn number, then you get a, uh, if you integrate out the partons, uh, the gaps, uh, then what you find is the level two turn time space. And that is the uh, effective description of a fractional quantum hole state. Uh, in fact, it's here. If you, um, these bosons have a uh, global U1 symmetry, and if you keep track of that with a background gauge field, you'll find the happen with the uh, uh, whole response for this state. Now, the Mars insulator uh, now uh, is given for this specific choice of uh, part time and uh, well, this. Besides 10 numbers, and then the effective uh, field theory, you integrate out all the partons again to the level one turn time theory. Now, turn time theory, of course, uh, has a ground state degeneracy on a manifold, on a man on a surface of genus G, it has a, it has a ground state degeneracy of um, the level to the power of 2G. And for level one turn simons, it's always there's no topological order. It's uh, uh, so there's a unique ground state on all closed surfaces. So this is actually a modern insulator. Because it's a gap, uh, it's a first of all, it's a gap theory, it's topologically trivial. And you can see that because these partons are coupled to a unit uh, flux of the emergent gauge field A, uh, there's, uh, there's statistical transmu transmutation and the excitations are really gap goes on. So this is what we interpret as a post Mott insulator. And finally, the superfluid phase, uh, the way they obtain this is by assuming that the uh, children churn number vanishes. So then we have to keep the next leading term in the Lagrangian, which is a Maxwell term, which can be dualized uh, to a um, compact U1 scalar, which is Maxwell. And now this scalar is interpreted as the Goldstone mode of this superfluid. Now their analysis sort uh, slightly misses a few things. Uh, if you, we find that, and as I'll come to later in this talk, if you actually account for monopole effects more carefully, what you actually find is that the possibility of a paired superfluid phase where you have two possible condensation but not single possible condensation. Okay, sure. sure. Yeah. So you're saying the part of friction of the lot is has an uh in the part on theory, yeah. but it has a uh uh 
the effective uh, Chern Simons level is just one. So the background gauge will uh, level zero. Yes, that's right. Yes, there'll there'll be no whole response. Uh, if you if you keep track of the global uh, U1 symmetry of the bosons with some capital A background gauge field, you'll find that there's no whole response. So as I'll come to later, as I said, uh, we can't just naively integrate out the fermion. This is a very uh, naive picture that gives uh, that turns out to give the correct picture of the phases, but uh, uh, one has to account for uh, instanton effects more carefully. And I'll come back to this a bit later. Well, uh, so that was the most theoretical and experimental motivation. So, um, so what does that mean for the system that we want to study? Well, we want to do essentially a Z2 version of what Berkeley and Negrevi did, but now instead of hardcore boson, we have heating spins with some Z2 symmetry. Uh, and now what we're going to do, the program is that we decompose these heating spins uh, into a uh, Marana modes, and then this will have an SO2N uh, gauge redundancy. And then uh, the, um, what, we, what we'll do is assume a mean field theory for these partons and then first map out the possible phases that we get. So if we use a, if we put all the QN uh, Majorana modes, I'll come back to this, uh, into uh, a class B topological superconductor. So what we get is a phase diagram like this, a chiral spin liquid, uh, a spontaneously symmetric broken phase, uh, where the mean field of these spins is broken. This could be a magnet or an antiquary magnet. And then uh, paramagnetic phases. And the critical the middle of the critical? Uh, the, the point in the middle? Yeah. 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 Yes. yes. Uh, if you, yeah, I'll come back to this. Yes. Yeah. Then I'll come up with, uh, so I'll also give some arguments for the critical theory describing the various transitions between these phases. Uh, and then finally, uh, account with, uh, to account for this uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking in the parton theory, we really need to account for instant effects. Uh, and I'll come, uh, that will be the last uh, topic of the talk. The fractionalized phases are quite easy to access in the parton framework, but conventional phases usually require some kind of non perturbative confinement mechanism. So, uh, as for the specific details, so the even spin that's now there is uh, written as a product of my animals, to when my animals in this case. And now, if you can form a big uh, vector of uh, the my animals, and then if you perform an SO2 when rotation on that uh, vector, if, uh, that that turns out to leave the uh, easing operator locally invariant. So the um, so what we do in the part, as usual in the parton approach is we first ignore this gauge structure and do mean field theory on this uh, parton Hamiltonian, and then fluctuations above this mean field theory are described by uh, in the infrared by an SO2n parton gauge theory. So as for our specific choice of uh, parton mean field ansatz. <laughs> n has to be greater than four for our case. Uh, sorry, two. Because it's, uh, four, 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 four. So two, 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 not four. So it's true. What is it? Uh, um, so that's almost like Kitaev's uh, representation, right? Um, for n equals two, uh, sorry, n equals one, then you get an abelian gauge theory. Uh, because, um, well, the instantons that I'm going to talk about are, uh, have Z2 charge, and that's only true in the, uh, that's only true in the non-abelian case for N greater than uh, uh, two. So, yeah, N greater than two or equal to two. So, um, yeah, so the physics is quite different for N equals, uh, N equals one. You don't get, I mean, the, the charge of the instantons is different, and then one would have to, we do that calculation and see what, uh, what we get. Could, so, yeah. Is there uh, too simple to describe what you want? You do the theory or? You get, we just get sort of qualitatively different phases for both one and both one. Um, so normally when you do part of the fractal idea, you said the boson is very much too far down. So the advantage of that is you can show that, you know, there's a hundred ton of extra transcript and you're going to back to the two years back. So that maybe gives you some confidence that you're the starting point of the new system. Justify even if you can't, you know, even if the person is difficult. So, in the, but in this case, you four, um, is that so? Can you still, like, is this, you know, can you show that this is, you know, that kind of thing? Well, uh, uh, but, I mean, between these expense and the minor animals? Well, uh, I mean, you're asking about the uh, validity of the part on decomposition itself, right? 
you know, when you take any one of the keys, right. you can actually do, you know, the, the, it, it is a hundred dollars. Right. When, when you go to, when, when two N is like four, it's not obvious that that's the case. For example, the example uh, the yes. for this, the exact the question of whether you can find that energetics and the number of in the lot of serum, but if you can follow the correct uh, situation, and always it'll be interacting but we just uh i guess that's the picture that we have in mind you can do hubbard's return of it and assume a mean field for the Hubbard's Ratonovich fields. Right. Um, yeah, so I've done that precise calculation only for uh, the case that you mentioned uh, with two bosons to two fermions and spin to uh, a Brickosol of fermions and so on. But uh, what we show in the paper is that, you know, you take the strong coupling limits of a lattice SON gauge theory, uh, and then that uh, you can map it to a uh, easing spin system, uh, sort of like how Fratkin did for the uh, Heisenberg model. And it's your two gauge theory. Officially, if I want to oh. basically give you the okay. Since I'm chairing the talk. Um. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, okay. So that was the Majorana representation. So again, uh, one more thing I should mention is that there is a V2 easing symmetry on the left-hand side. So how do, how do we assign that V2 charge uh, to the Majorana particle? Now there's no canonical choice. Uh, this is a gate choice that we have to make. In fact, uh, you can assign the V2 to any odd number of uh, Majorana uh, modes, but what we choose to do is uh, write this W as uh, for instance, matrix, uh, um, well, the, this minus sign could appear in principle anywhere, but this one gate choice that we need. So this will come in, uh, this will become important when we account for uh, instanton attacks in the end. Right. So the part on Anzaj is that all these Majorana modes are assumed to form some topological, class D topological superconductor with turn number C. Uh, this is a fully SO2N gauge invariant Anzaj. There's no Higgsing like in the hardcore boson case that we saw earlier. So the, uh, the expectation is that we can integrate out these gap partons and uh, write down an effective Lagrangian of level C uh, confirmants for this echo to n gauge field, and then And the idea is that, again, we can vary C to find various phases. Uh, the step of integrating out the partons is actually uh, is a bit too naive, but uh, in, one could still do it to just get an idea of the uh, phases that we can access and then correct uh, uh, understanding later. <laughs> I guess, yeah, more carefully. Uh, so this is the theory. For C, uh, if the turn number is greater than or equal to two, uh, then there is uh, this, this theory has the general ground states, and that's indicative of, uh, on, a, on a surface of genus G, and that's indicative of intrinsic topological order, and this theory has anionic excitations. And uh, because this is supposed to describe be a description of an easing spin system, uh, it is indicative of some uh, quantum spin liquid space. And in fact, since it breaks down reversal symmetry as well, I will spin space. So now, for if the churn number is one, uh, that's the atom we can find, but level one turns out to be a unique ground state, and there's no topological order. Um, and one can actually show uh, this could still be an SPT, but one can actually show that this is a uh, paramagnetic phase, and I'll come back to an argument for that. Uh, in fact, there's a CFT argument which is that at the mean field level, if you forget about the gauge fluctuations, uh, then the, um, since these uh, Majorana modes form a plus the topological superconductor, then the edge will have uh, uh, n copies uh, of the uh, n-free chiral Majorana fermions on the boundary. Um, but uh, if we gauge the SON, if we get rid of that uh, spurious entry and then there's a trivial safety on the boundary. So we don't we don't have any edge modes in this case. So this is a part, this is one argument, but I'll come back to another argument uh, using dualities. Right. And then finally, if the uh, transcendence level is zero, so we have to keep the dominant term as a maximal term, 
well, but in this non-abelian gauge theory, uh, then we have uh, essentially the um, common law that this is uh, young Mill theory in three dimensions uh, with this the maximal term and no term or anything is trivially gap -hunting. And this, uh, I will argue later, it's not clear at all now. I will argue later that this is actually the um, state, this, this, this is the phase that breaks this easing Z2 symmetry. So now we can write a theory that interpolates between all these two phases. And for that, we assume now a specific choice of uh, Barton band structure. For simplicity, we're going to focus on just the C equals, uh, C equals two, C equals zero, and C equals one phases. And now the uh, band structure, the specific band structure we assume is that there is some lower band which is always still uh, with churn number equal to one. And that will give the uh, consignment level one term there. And then uh, there is, um, there are two, for instance, like in the Kitai model, there are two Girard forms and uh, K and K prime at which we have uh, linearized uh, Majorana fermion uh, in the continuum. And by providing various masses uh, to these Majorana fermions, we can actually tune the turn number and go between uh, the various phases that I mentioned earlier. So, for instance, if both these Marana come on the side have uh, positive mass, so then you get the uh, turn liquid because each Marana come on contributes a turn number of half, and then uh, there are two, so that'll add to the one there. So, similarly, you can map out the uh, And now uh, I said that the I said I'd give another argument uh, for the paramagnetic phases, and why should why should you believe and why should you believe this theory? And uh, one more thing, so this this theory, which interpolates between the different phases, you can also get the critical theory from this by tuning the uh, fermion mass to zero. So why should you believe that this is the critical theory? So well, um, here we use, uh, for instance, uh, well-known results about the paramagnetic and magnetic transition in easing systems. So what we do is that, uh, so to tune to that transition, we set one of the fermion mass to zero, and we can integrate out the massive fermion uh, to get a level half consignment plus a massless Majorana. So now this, uh, using recently conjectured echo n duality, uh, one can show that this is dual to uh, essentially the uh, real scalar at the Wilson Fisher fixed point, which we all know describes the transition uh, between the ordered and the ordered state in using system. So that's a good indication that this is the correct uh, critical theory. But now there's another problem. If you if you if we tune to the so if we tune to what is supposed to be the ferromagnetic phase, there is no indication of any sort of uh, symmetry breaking of this uh, easing Z2 symmetry. And that's because we've been too naive in integrating out the fermions. They uh, on the lattice, these partons couple to the compact version, they couple to the group element and not the uh K2 itself. And this implies that. At low energies, what we have is really a compact gauge theory. So, for instance, the picture to have in mind, inspired from the wheeling gauge theory, is that this uh, magnetic flux on a given plaquette is really an angle and it can jump by two pi times an integer. And if you visualize this plaquette evolving in time uh, to get a cube, then we have net magnetic flux coming out of this cube. And in the continuum theory, that's modeled as a magnetic monopole sitting at the center of this. So, how do we account for these uh, monopole monopoles in the continuum theory? So that's using uh, the concept of monopole operators. But well, since people here have worked on uh, monopoles, I'm just going to skip this review slide and assume that you know this. And if you don't, you can just ask me later. Right. To account for monopole effects in this uh, non abelian gauge theory, SO2N SO gauge theory. Uh, so what we do is we work with a topologically equivalent theory. We get rid of the uh, low line uh, band with turn number one. And we work with the with this equivalent theory, which has total turn number zero. So now to account for monopoles, what we need to do is really uh, resum an instance on gas. Uh, there are monopole operators in this theory, but now the topological charge of the monopole is uh, in Z2. And the way to see this is that uh, semi-classically, how would we represent a Dirac monopole in non-abelian gauge theory? We would just place a Dirac monopole in some SO2 subgroup of uh, this large SO2N subgroup. But then uh, using a rotation, so you can keep SO3 in mind. So this is like in SO3, the uh, magnetic flux points along a certain plane, but of course you can rotate this vector to minus itself. So you can actually invert the magnetic flux in a given SO2 subgroup. Uh, so, um, so plus one, a monopole of charge plus one is equivalent to a monopole of charge minus one and so on. 
And this combined this fact combined with the stability argument. Uh, for instance, if we have two monopoles of plus one and plus one some distance apart, you know, it's energetically uh, favorable for one of the monopoles to flip its invert its charge, invert the flux, and uh, uh, annihilate each other. This has total topological charge zero. So the uh, monopoles in this theory have only uh, two topologically distinct uh, charges. So now uh, we have an instanton gas sum, but inside this um, Inside inside this summation is a Majorana fermion part integral in the background of this monopole. And now this is crucial because whenever we have fermions in some sort of topological background, the natural question to ask is are there any zero modes associated? And the answer is yes. Uh, these are not zero energy modes, there are zero modes of this uh, Dirac operator that appear in the action, um, and they are experimentally localized on the monopole. So now uh, I mean, it's easy to see that these, these really kill the part the goal because the part the goal is proportional to the determinant of that Dirac operator. But a more instructive way to see it is by using a uh, mode expansion of the fermion field. So for instance, if we were to mode expand the fermion field and define the fermion part the goal measure, what we would do is write q naught plus uh, non-zero modes. This is a Grassmann variable, and this is the uh, zero mode that's bound to the instanton. And now we can define the fermion measure as follows, d eta naught, and then the, the part that comes from uh, non-zero modes. And now since eta naught doesn't appear in the action at all, this unpaired Grassmann integral will really kill the partition function. Okay, so that's uh, one result that uh, these monopoles don't contribute to the partition function. So is there anything that they actually contribute to or they actually or are they useless? No, but uh, and the argument is that they are not useless. In fact, you can let's try to make this part integral non-zero. So what would we need? We need to insert uh, an eta naught here, for instance, to make this Grassmann integral non-zero. And the way to do that is by inserting fermion fields inside the uh, partition function. So that doesn't contribute. That doesn't calculate the partition function. What it calculates are correlation functions with these operators. So uh, with these break a certain symmetry that the original Lagrangian did not have. And that's the uh, uh, that's the um, independent Z2 symmetry of the fermion. So this this sort of symmetry breaking needs to be uh, reflected in the effect of Lagrangian, right? So could uh, be, but the basic basic idea to keep in mind is that these monopole operators, uh, so because to get a in the presence of a monopole, we need to insert these operators in the partition function to get a non-zero value. These monopoles are really associated with creation and destruction of uh, Majorana fermions, and for Majoranas, they're the same. And an analogous result will also hold for the uh, hardcore bosons that I mentioned earlier. So now, if we actually perform this uh, instanton gas sum, so in the absence of uh, these monopoles, that was done by Polyakov, which you all know, and it results in a in the Beeling gauge theory it results in a mass for the uh, photon. But in this case, uh, what happens if we do this sum with these fermions is that we get an instanton induced term. And this is called the Kirk vertex because Kirk was the first one to perform this computation in uh, QCD4 for the BBST instanton, where this uh, such an instanton induced term is responsible for uh, showing the ABJ and all in that theory. So now this instanton induced term uh, is a monopole operator expressed with Euclidean Majorana zero modes. Uh, this EP really generates the SO2 subgroup uh, of SON where we put the monopole. So it, there is a memory of the uh, main choice that we made, so it's not fully gate invariant. And uh, one can, in fact, and that's the result of the fact that we did a uh, semi classical calculation in some fixed, possibly fixed gate. Um, and then there's also a vertex factor delta, which is a bit of a range that comes from the spatial structure of the zero. Now, uh, the important part about the important thing to note about this instanton induced term is that it breaks the spurious uh, symmetry in the parent theory, that is, without the without, uh, without the box term. And that's the magnetic symmetry where, you could, where the monopole operator goes to uh, minus itself. And then the microscopic eating symmetry, which we associated to, uh, to uh, Majorana fermion, that was this W that I defined earlier. But now, uh, the instanton induced term breaks this with a diagonal subgroup. So we need to perform this magnetic DQ to switch the sign of the monopole operator, but also uh, perform this uh, transformation by W 
to get to leave the seven variables. And this diagonal repeats of group is actually the proper um, uh, representation of the microscopic easing symmetry in the uh, continuum infrared gauge field. And that's important because if these monopoles condense, if they get an expectation value, and that implies the uh, spontaneous breaking of that easing Z2 symmetry. And that's needed to account for, uh, and that's the argument that says that this phase with total churn number zero is really uh, some sort of magnet. And now while we can't get, uh, while getting the fully gating variant vertex is analytically impractical, the only vertex that we can think of with the same symmetry is a big barrier on like this. Uh, which is to an explicitly to an invariant, and it has the same uh, right. So one can again use the same duality to uh, obtain the uh, transition between a uh, direct transition between a chiral liquid and the magnetic phase. And now uh, for that, for that, the masses of both the Majorana functions have to be tuned to zero, uh, and then switched on simultaneously to a positive value. Um, now, what could you, what could possibly do that? And that can be protected by uh, some sort of lattice symmetry. For instance, if you take the Kitai honeycomb model and you apply a uh, uh, and and you uh, where there's inverting symmetry, you only have Voldane masses, uh, and then um, that symmetry that symmetry will force uh, the masses of both these Majorana functions to be equal to each other, and that will protect the direct transition from the magnetic phase to the chiral transition. So right, so that's my summary. Um, I'll just leave it on the slide there and uh, end. Yeah, so uh, I, have, I have a question about the action relation procedure. If you probably have very central to your work that you discussed in the, in the beginning, set up the, the continuum theory, and you mentioned that you want to have a more general part of the multiple Right. Uh, so the question was about uh, we want to make sure that we completed the Hilbert space, one is put it back to the Hilbert space. That's right. And this is usually done somehow from strength. That's right. Um, but that, yeah. Well, yeah. So my question is yeah, long question is if I do just a mile, mile run of, uh, by me, this is often in a more generic application uh, to just parties. This becomes the constant becomes uh, associated with the temporal complement of the gauge field. That's right. But with multiple Majorana polyon for each scheme, right. uh, this constraint seems to me to be some kind of an interaction charm of the effective theory, where we must have a legendar multiplier multiplying a quartic Majorana or higher Majorana bucket. So in all these theories, it'll always be the time component of the gauge field that enforces uh, that that constraint. Uh, I mean, you can, you can you can sort of you can sort of get this part on decomposition. There's a way to derive everything very uh, uh, in a detailed way, micro, microscopically. So one way that I can think of is you just take the guitar representation of the of, of an easing spin, and then uh, source of uh, do successive part on decomposition, if you will, of that, you know, for instance. Uh, is that, was that clear what I said? So just do tau z equals uh, something like c1, c2, and then decompose, write this mode as uh, gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, and so on. Uh, you can, you can, you can do yeah, that. So then all of the but it's a bit contrived. The condition will be the product of Meyer and Hunter's multiplying on each side to the item, right? And uh, the, the legend of multiplier for such an object seems to be in the action formalism leading to some kind of some kind of interaction. It's like that, and then it's equal to the item scale. The gauge invariant group. like an AI. So the in-off constraint, what it does is that it sets, it projects everything that's on, it sets all the S by terms. All of these are projected out. This is projected out even before the effective field theory is done. No, that's what the gauge theory does. Yeah. Another place where this was done is for, for when it has some work on the proton Descriptions of Tom Austin. If you write too much an operator, it was brought up three terminals. 
Uh, that's how the new equals one third state. Yes, yeah, yeah, for example. Yeah, it's the time the product of three terms. Three terms. Then you, you, you couple that with its three gauge fill and then the in odds component of the gauge theory. Basically, project that on the other two. Or then you have to. You can divide them off. That's right, but there's multiple other things because it's, it's not a deal in the same thing. So multiple, multiple properties of the yeah, that's why it's based on several components. Yeah, that's pretty good. Did I go over time? Oh. Okay, so I think we'll stop here and uh, I think we'll